Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show is a triple threat, if you like. Three of my favourite authors. Um, each one definitely a channel favourite. Um, as ever, please do let us know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. And of course, don't forget to hashtag Team Fear and be safe, not sorry. These, uh, these stories tonight were actually the entries for three rounds of the Evil Idol competition 2019 that I entered. Um, unfortunately, I didn't make it through to the second round, uh, but I'm incredibly chuffed and proud of the fact that I was selected from a list of 180, I think, applications, uh, entered the first 50, but didn't quite make the final draw for the 25 uh, that go through to the next stage. Best of luck to all of those that are continuing in that competition. Absolutely wonderful narrations. Uh, very, very high caliber narrations at that. So I was very chuffed to be amongst those very talented people. Thank you guys for the extra um, extra support and uh, and the, uh, the short notice on getting the story over to me for that competition. Um, as far as I know, I believe these will go on to their podcast. Um, and possibly onto the two websites that Craig runs over at Chillin's House and creepypasta.com. But I couldn't be happier, guys, as I said. What an absolutely incredible year. Finishing on almost 26,000 subscribers now. Um, I'm bowled over, more than happy with how things have turned out, how things are progressing. And I'm still buzzing that you guys enjoy this channel so, so much. Um, thank you each and every one of you listeners that tunes in time and time again or even takes time to let our advert run for a little while. Um, it really, really does help us so, so much. Anyway, with that aside, let's get into the first round entry from Wayne Harbison, entitled A Tale of the Witchkin, Shadows on a Tin Star, The Thirst. Marshal Affair McKnight climbed down from his horse and began to pick through the eerily silent camp. The travellers had picked a prime spot back away from the trail beside the creek that shared his given name. They had picketed their horses and built a small fire with a cookpot over it. The camp had all the markings of a family that was moving further west. From the location of their camp, he figured they were out of Reno and headed southwest towards either Carson City or more likely one of the smaller mining and logging towns on the shore of Lake Tahoe, probably Lunum. He called to the camp several times before entering it, but the only answer he got was the whinnying from the horses as they complained of being too long on the picket line. Taking off his hat, he looked towards the east where the sun was just peeking over Mount Rose. Something felt wrong here, terribly wrong. These people should have been stirring long before now, and they were less than a day's travel to Lunum, or even Crystal Bay. He sniffed at the air, and then winced. Hidden deep under the wood smoke, animal, and scorched coffee smells, there was a pungent odour of open grave. Thumbing the hammer thong on the Colt's 1878 he wore on his hip, he called again. Hello, the camp! His only answer were the calls of the morning birds and the buzzing of the insects. Carefully, he began searching the camp looking for signs of life. A quick glance inside the wagon told him all he needed to know. Four human shapes were cocooned inside woolen army blankets, unmoving, and there was a stench of death and the grave about them. It set his stomach to churning. Holding back the bile that threatened his throat, he searched the inside of the wagon, careful not to touch the cocoons. He found a doll appropriate for a young girl and a small boy's hat. Double checking the cocoons, he realized that they were at least two forms missing and that that was not a good sign. Climbing down from the wagon, he studied the dun-coloured dry soil. There didn't seem to be any signs of trouble. He quickly identified at least eight different sets of footprints, two of which came directly into the camp and then left in the same direction. Intrigued, he studied them for a moment. One set of prints were male boots, expensive riding boots like he remembered wearing as a young lad back in a lifetime ago in Mobile. Not what one would expect, 
in the rugged Sierra Nevada mountains. The other set looked like working boots. He squatted next to the prints, ran his finger just above their outline. Then, bending down further, he first flared his nostrils and then breathed in deeply. Again, there was an overwhelming odour of dead flesh and open grave, and not much else. Retrieving his horse, he followed the prince down to the creek and could see where they turned north to follow its banks and not crossing it. Entering a pine thicket, he suddenly caught a whiff of blood and death. Instantly, going on alert, he looked around, but saw nothing. He carefully picked his way through the thicket, following his nose. Perhaps fifty yards into the copse of trees, the steady buzzing sounds of flies caught his attention. Looking up, he saw what at first he thought was a black mass of leaves, but soon realised it was a small human form draped over a low limb. A tiny, bare foot was hanging from the bottom of the mass of flies. Looking around the area, he saw another mass of crawling insects on the ground. And this time, only the small hand of a boy was visible. A fur stilled his mind as he climbed down from the saddle and tethered his horse. With a quick leap and scramble, he climbed the tree with ease. Reaching the mass of flies covering the small body, he began to shoo them away with his hat until he could see the form of a young girl, almost about four years old. Her body had been shoved into the fork of a limb, her little neck was at an odd angle, and he could see where something had torn out most of her throat. Gently, he removed the body and scrambled back down the tree and lay her on the soft pine needles. Then he turned his attention to the other mass, only to find a little boy of about the same age. His neck too had been broken, and his throat ripped out. But his body had fed somewhat the worse for wear on the ground where small animals could get to it. The first soul raged at the thought of innocent blood being spilled so casually. He could feel the beast that resided in his soul begin to stir and pace as its temper grew, so did the agitation of the beast, and now he had an idea of what he was dealing with. Placing the bodies across his saddle, he covered them with the blanket and led the horse out of the trees and back up towards the camp, knowing what he had to do. He found a shovel tied to the side of the wagon and set out digging two large pits in the ground. It was nearly noon when he finished with that part, and he worked up a powerful thirst a thirst he would quench from the water of the creek. Then, spreading some dry tinder at the bottom of each pit, he began to build a pile made of wood from the surrounding trees. Double-checking his work to ensure that it would burn hot enough to do what it needs to do without getting out of hand, he worked well into the mid-afternoon. Checking the sky periodically, he watched the sun begin to slip lower into the horizon. He had to hurry because sundown would make things far worse. When he was finished with that, he took a hatchet and sharpened four stakes he'd cut from a nearby rowan tree. Then came the hard part, pulling the tarp from the wagon. He climbed up inside the first figure, cocooned in the woolen blankets. Picking it up, he hopped down next to the pits, and with a stake in one hand, he rolled the form out of its blanket. The woman's flesh was pale, thin, and nearly translucent, showing the outlines of veins beneath it. She appeared to be in her late twenties, with long blonde hair. He could see her eyes flicker back and forth under the white flesh of her eyelids. She cried a mournful wail of pain and sorrow that echoed across the valley. Still, mostly asleep, the pitiful thing that had once been a woman, a wife and a mother began to writhe and crawl towards the shadow of the wagon as its skin blistered and burned in the afternoon sunlight. Ophir stepped over it and drove the stake through its heart with a single thrust. Then, with the shovel he used to dig the pits, he separated her head from the body. Chunk! The burning and blistering stopped immediately, and the face suddenly had a peaceful countenance upon it. As he would expect, there was no blood in the body. He then gently laid the head on the pyre and the body upon the next. He repeated the process three more times before laying the body of the children upon the pyres. Saying a prayer to whatever God might listen, he set the pyres ablaze. Normally, such a fire would not burn long or hot enough to reduce the bodies to ash, but he stood there staring into the blaze, calling up the witcheries his father, his mother, his grandmother, and even his great-grandmother had taught him. Pouring his will into the flame, he watched as it grew hotter. He watched it first burn orange, then red, and finally white hot. As he stood there making sure the souls of at least this family could find rest.
He would not rest until he had found for them. The beast in his soul demanded no less. Cain Mordor lugged the last heavy box down the steps into the old Shipton house and looked around at his work. Five heavy wooden boxes that made Cain think uncomfortably of coffins lay scattered around the old root cellar, each one nailed shut. It had been hot and thirsty work bringing them halfway up the mountainside to this old house that some foreigner had paid good money to buy. They then turned around and spent more good money to have that slick lawyer, Dickinson, hire a bunch of carpenters to come here and fix up the place. Cain Mordor was not a man accustomed to hard work. And to be honest, something Mordor avoided whenever possible. If he hadn't been so desperate, he'd not even taken the job when it was offered to him by Dickerson. But Mordor was broke, and the pay was good. Three dollars for half a day's work to haul them boxes out here, put them in a root cellar and lock behind him. That was twice what he would expect out of the silver mine and a whole week of pay for working with one of the logging gangs. Couldn't beat that with a stick. Dusting his hands off, he noticed the sun begin to dip behind the western mountains of Carson Range. A chill went down his spine as he watched the reds and oranges and purples flare across the darkening sky, making it appear as if it was bleeding. Shrugging it off to the unexpectedly cool temperatures for September they'd been having, he turned back and went back down the stairs to the heavy wooden table and lit the kerosene lamp there. Outside, the wind began to pick up when he heard the sharp bang of a loose shutter against the side of the house. The old place had been abandoned since the Shiptons had all up and died from the flu that came through about two years ago. They were buried out in the family plot and nobody ever visited them. Wait! He seemed to have heard a voice at the edge of his hearing and it was as much a command as it was a request. Cain looked around the room to see who had spoken, only to find nothing but the boxes sitting peacefully on the hard dirt floor. He glanced over at the lamp and something about how the fire danced across the wick caught his attention. For long moments he simply stood there, staring at it as it leapt and danced under the chimney like some fiery imp from hell. He didn't know how long he'd stood there, mesmerised by it, but when he finally looked up, the lengthening shadows had stretched into the eerie twilight of dusk. Shaking his head, he cursed himself for not paying attention to the time and reached for the lamp. BAM! The light in the lamp fluttered and made the shadows dance along the walls in time with the leaping flame as the door leading out of the cellar slammed shut. Feeling his heart pound in his chest, Kane grabbed the lamp and headed up the short pine stairs to the huge grey doors. He pushed at them, but they were locked from the outside. A man-shaped shadow flashed across the slits between the grey weathered planks. Hey, let me out of here, Cain demanded. Wait. Again, the voice at the edge of his hearing said. A strange stillness came over the man that was Cain Mordor, and he found himself unable to move his feet. A small scratching came from behind him. He turned to investigate, only to see a bony hand reach out from under the lid of one of the boxes. Cain found himself mesmerized while the horrific form that pushed back the lid of the box emerged with the stillness of the dead. He was tall, thin, with a hooked nose and eyes that reflected the fiery red flames of hell. Bushy, still grey eyebrows with a foundation of a forehead that arced up into a thick head of hair of the same shade. A long moustache and a pointed beard framed the cruel mouth with thin lips and sharp canines. The tips of his ears came to fine points and he was dressed in a kind of suit Cain would expect from a rich dandy back in the east. It was all black, including his shirt, and the only bit of colour about him was a small red pin on his tie. Some part of Kane's brain was screaming to run, to get the hell out of there, but his feet refused to budge as the man drew closer, seeming to glide across the floor without taking a single step. Kane's heart pounded in his chest as the man approached and smiled cruelly, displaying the pair of long wolf-like fangs on either side of his upper teeth. Cain felt his body tremble as the man touched the side of his face with a cold, dead hand. As terrible sucking sounds began to fill the room, some part of Cain's mind screamed out in terror. It was well into the night when the deed was done. The family's belongings had been fed to the fire like in the traditions of the ancient Vikings. Six crosses marked the pit where he had burnt the bodies of the family before spreading their ashes into the creek below. 
Fur didn't know their names, but the family Bible was for the Vordenberg family, so that was the name he put on the largest cross. He waited in the night, his own thoughts troubled by what he'd seen and done. Fur had grown up in a Witchkin family and had been taught by both his grandmother, Mary Beaumere, and his great-grandmother, Catherine McNaughton, Nie Dubois, about various other Witchkin. And so he had known what to do to destroy the things in the wagon. The question was... Could he find the undead responsible for this before it spread so wide that it would take a miracle to stop it? Feeding and watering the two horses of the Vordenberg family, as well as his own, he sat back against his saddle and waited, his forty-five, his Henry, and his father's cavalry saver near at hand. He expected to have visitors again tonight, as he expected that the one responsible for what happened to this family to come back and check on their work. It was just a few hours before sunrise when he saw something gliding silently through the trees, disturbing not a single leaf or pine needle. It was tall and thin and wore a tin star on its vest and six-shooter on its hip, and did not expect to be seen as it circled the campsite to see what had become of its kill. In life, this man had been middle-aged, lean and weathered by the elements. Evidently, he had been the town sheriff somewhere nearby. In death, he was a washed-out image of his former self and had now taken to hunting travellers. Finally, deciding on the direct approach, the creature stepped out of the trees and called, Hello, the camp! Ophir smiled to himself and thought, There's one. He did not, however, answer. Hello, the camp! The creature called again. There's two. Just one more. Hello, the camp! The creature called a third time. Ophir noted the sound of disappointment in its voice. Hello, Ophir answered on the third call. Who are you and what do you want? I am the Sheriff Plant from Lunham and I am looking for a missing family. Oh really? he asked. Family got a name? Ophir watched the creature struggle for a name. Finally, it said, Jones! Ophir smiled and told him, I haven't met anybody named Jones on the trail, and I came all the way from Carson City. You got a name? Mm, I do. Care to give it to me? Ask me again. A fear answered. What's your name? It finally asked, once again disappointed. Oh, Fur McKnight, U.S. Marshal, he told him. Of course, that was the only name that Ophir had been using since he left Bon Travail after the unfortunate events that had shattered his family. He, his uncle Teddy, and his grandmother all agreed that perhaps it was time for the McNaughton name to sleep for a while. So Ophir had changed it to McKnight, which is what McNaughton meant anyway. Can I come into the camp, Marshal? The creature asked, holding up its hands. If you can, he replied. Again the man asked, Can I come in to the camp? If you can, Ophir repeated. You're not being very hospitable, the sheriff complained. Mm, perhaps, Ophir told him, rising to his feet. His left hand concealed the sabre behind his back, his right hovering over his forty-five. Dangerous times. You are so right, the creature growled. With lightning reflexes, the thing masquerading as Sheriff Plant drew its pistol and fired. Ophir hit the ground rolling and came up firing his colt twice while the sheriff cocked his for a second shot. The first bullet ripped through the sheriff's chest. The second, however, caught him right between the eyes and blew out the back of his brain case. The vampire hit the ground having never gotten off his second shot. Moving quickly before the vampire could get itself back together, Ophir stepped in and hacked through the back of its neck with a sabre until its head rolled away. This time... The vampire began to crumble to dust in the cool night air. Ophir watched as the ashes and the dust mingled in the rising heat from his campfire and sparkled like lightning bugs rising in the night sky. Shaking his head, he couldn't help but think about the waste. He knew the sheriff was not going to be the last undead he was going to encounter. He knew that there was a second vampire out there, probably the one that made the sheriff. He could already feel the pull of the arcane, and it was coming from the direction of the town of Lunham. 
The beast in his soul growled at the thought. It's three o'clock in the morning, and all is not well. Not by a long shot. For six hours now, the woman I've known as Tracy Day has been missing. No one has heard from her. She is probably dead. Why do I think these thoughts? She can't be dead. My life revolves around her. She can't be dead. I won't accept that line of negativity in my thoughts. But she is missing. It all began approximately six hours earlier. She had called me on the telephone and had just left a mutual friend's house on her way to a secluded camping ground where she lived in rural southern Oklahoma. She and her better half had once again started screaming at each other over nominal household chores. And me? Did I fail to mention that I was involved with this beautiful, talented woman? Oh, not physically. I hadn't even met her. An innocent flirtation which began online had grown during the past few weeks into something different. However, as I sit here waiting for some word of her safety in this dark and lonely house, I realise how one-sided the attraction has been. I live at least four hours away from where she's disappeared in Oklahoma. Mutual friends have assured me she's going to be okay. But maybe I might want to reconsider pursuing someone closer to my own age. Tracy, they tell me, doesn't need another father in her life. I sit here in this damn darkness, waiting. The frustration is thick. What was it that she texted me right before everything shut down? I scroll back up the cell phone screen and read. I'm leaving this fucking campground. Something's not right. Moments later, another text. OMG, I hear them calling me by my name. How do they know my name? I reread the text. Get to your car, Tracy. No heroics, please. Silence again, and then she manages to send a darkened photograph. There's a faint glow in the center of the photo. I enlarge the photo, and I can see something in the glowing area, but I can't quite make out what it is. I find a magnifying glass and place it over the area in question. My eyes grow wide. I can't believe what's pursuing her in the woods to where she left her SUV. Other friends have joined me online. They too have the picture, but... They're texting among themselves and trying to get an answer to their questions. She won't respond. One guy asks why someone doesn't call her on her cell phone. Doesn't anyone have a number? Silence. Then one word appears on my screen. My name. I have the number. I place a call. The phone rings and rings and then I hear silence and I hang up. I call again but this time I receive a notification that Tracy isn't available at this time but that I can leave a message after the beep. Leave a message? Hell yeah, I'll leave a message. Hey, Tracy, this is Devin. You know that picture you sent me? Run, Tracy. Run hard and fast. Get to your car and don't look back. Since then, nothing. I tell myself if none of us have heard from her by daylight, I'm going to load my Colt M1911 45 automatic and my 30 6 and drive to Oklahoma. I text and tell everyone I tried to get her on the phone, but the phone is turned off, and I'm worried. I paced the floor, interacted with our friends. I've tried to pretend I was just a concerned friend, but as I watch this damn blank screen, I can't deny my feelings any longer. My God, I'm in love with a married woman, half my age. A woman whom I've only known for a few weeks via Facebook and video chats. She was responsible for making me smile to laugh and to believe someone did care for a 67-year-old man, even if he knew they couldn't be together. There is a one-word message which has showed up on my phone screen, one word being sent to me from Tracy's phone. Jeez. Nothing more. No one is on chat this late or early. I'm still here hoping against hope. I know what was pursuing her as she ran through the woods earlier. I know the odds of her escaping were long. Still, I can't give up. I have to pray. Pray that she didn't stumble. Pray that she found safety. Another word appears. My eyes begin to water. My throat is dry. Tasty. I scream. Then I text back. 
My hands shaking, tears welling up in my eyes, but I type, I text. I will come for you. I will find you, gut you and leave you for the scavengers. There was a reply, something like a kid might have written. Bring it. Don't sing it. I erupt in anger. My best friend has been killed and, if I believe the messenger, eaten. I will avenge her. I will avenge her. Another message. I'm coming for you, old man. I stared at the message. My phone vibrated. Tracy's name came up and my hand is shaking, but I answer. The voice on the other end is dripping with sweetness. Hi, lover, the voice says. I know I gave you and my friends a fright, but everything's wonderful. Oh, I've missed you, lover. I'm driving down to see you. I'll see you in a few hours. Yeah, it had sounded like Tracy, but she wouldn't have ever called me lover. She never expressed any interest in pursuing a romantic relationship with me. And somewhere in the furthest recesses of my mind, a voice broke through. You know that wasn't Tracy, don't you? Yeah, I knew. Only it didn't know that I knew. I went into my restroom and stripped away my sweaty clothes and showered. Then I dressed, put my shoulder holster on. I didn't like carrying a gun on me. Even though I had a concealed handgun permit and Texas had an open carry law if you had a CHP. I made myself a good breakfast and formulated a plan. The creature was probably coming even now. No doubt it planned to arrive after dark. It used the darkness. It manipulated the darkness. It embraced the darkness because it was a creature of darkness. My friend Kirk reloaded all of his ammunition and, as a joke, had made a dozen silver bullets for his 9mm. Kirk didn't know it, but he was about to loan me at least six of the magic bullets. I spent several hours with Kirk who was a fountain of knowledge. He listened to my outrageous claim and said just because this abomination said Tracy was tasty. It might not have killed her, but was manipulating her physical form and feasting on her emotions. Don't assume the worst, old man, until you are faced with it. I'm tagging along with you when you leave. Much of the day was spent waiting. I've never waited on anything for so long in my entire life. The weather had taken a turn. Outside the house, it was a pleasant 82 degrees. The weather channel was predicting a drop in the temperature after dark. Darkness and the temperature dropped much quicker than expected and storm clouds began to gather and lightning could be observed far in the northwest skies. Thunder was a distant rumble. I jumped when the phone rang. Kirk stepped forward and I put the conversation on speakerphone. The voice was Tracy's, but I knew it wasn't Tracy talking. The thing that was possessing Tracy's mind, body and voice, told me it was drawing nearer. Soon it would reunite me with Tracy. It said it knew I was going to be tasty, just like Tracy. Kirk looked at me. What, he asked, are we dealing with? And I could only shrug my shoulders. It would be the next day that I found out about the murders of a couple parked inside a roadside park. Apparently, they had been parked in the rear of a park when the silver SUV pulled in. A beautiful blonde woman opened the driver's side door and stepped out. She looked disheveled, with cuts and scrapes. Her designer jeans were torn, her long-sleeved t-shirt ripped. She moved in a stumbling manner, her speech slurred. She had said she had been assaulted and needed help. The young woman sitting in the car told her new husband to make her a space in the back seat. They had intoned to get this poor woman to an emergency room. The blonde told him her name was Tracy and she really appreciated the help. As they were helping her into the back seat, she asked the man to retrieve the package she'd left in the back floorboard. He told her he would and walked over to the SUV opened the back door and screamed. He turned to tell his wife to get the hell away from the woman, but there was no woman. In her place was a monster, which promptly grasped the young woman by her throat. His three-inch claw sank deeply into the soft tissue of the throat, and it ripped her throat out. The husband was paralyzed with fear. Now he saw his wife, but it wasn't his wife. What was left of his rational mind screamed at him to run. The creature now posing as his wife said something soothing, something strange. It 
said the word. Tasty. But he heard the voice in his head. The man's eyes were wide open, his mouth forming words that would not come. He realized this creature was now in front of him. Gone was the image it had projected of his wife. Now it was simply the monster, and it opened its foul and putrid mouth and bit into the man's throat. When he was through with the husband's body, it was tossed effortlessly into the back of the SUV with Tracy's body. I could feel the creature drawing closer. The storm had finally arrived. Kirk had taken a spot on the balcony of my two-story wood frame home and was watching for any car that might pull up, especially new silver-coloured SUVs. We didn't know the creature had changed vehicles, and towards midnight, Kirk stepped back inside as the rain fell and the storm raged. In the distance, he saw a car moving slowly up the road, coming towards my house. He could tell it was not the silver SUV, so he wasn't paying much attention until the car ran up and over the curb in front of the house. Kirk watched in horror and fascination as a large creature stepped awkwardly out of the vehicle. There were no street lights, and unless the lightning flashed, no one could tell what was standing in front of my house in the yard. When the lightning lit up the sky again, Kirk rubbed his eyes. He'd never seen Tracy, but there was no doubt she was standing in my front yard, wearing torn and tattered clothing. The doorbell rang. I stepped to the door. Who is it? I asked, but I already knew who it was. The same soft, sweet voice called me by name, told me she'd escaped from the monster and wanted to come inside. My hand reached for the knob, but Kirk's strong right hand caught mine. He put a finger to his lips and pulled me away. I got good news and bad news for you. Oh, who am I kidding? I have nothing but bad news. What's the bad news? Oh. Tracy is here, but it's not Tracy. I saw a monster step out of the car, and it's apparently ditched Tracy's ride. There was a knock on the door. It started us both. As quietly as I could, I stepped to the front door, looked out at the peephole and saw what appeared to be Tracy standing there. Another knock, but with a bit more force. I spoke up and asked who it was. Tracy's voice answered. Would I let her inside? I answered. No. Please, the voice said. I'm cold. I'm hungry. And I'm thirsty. Again. No. All was quiet. Then thunderous pounds on the door. A more masculine voice, deep, guttural, demanded I open the door. A third time, and I said, No. And the pounding stopped. Kirk and I looked at one another. The lights inside the house suddenly went out. What else was going to happen? A light's knock on the door. Who is it? I asked. Kirk had his 30 6 and had slipped up the staircase. A new voice answered, identifying itself as my neighbour, Mr. Burris. It did sound like Mr. Burris, but then I remembered Mr. Burris had passed away a year earlier. My hand froze on the doorknob. I asked Mr. Burris what he wanted, and I put my own answer into the thought. I'd like to sleep with your dog tonight. It was difficult to suppress my laugh. Had this not been a monster, I would have burst out laughing. And why? I asked in my mind again. Because she's so pretty. Now, I did laugh. I laughed because I didn't even own a dog. Hey, Burris, I said calmly. I know you died, and I don't own a dog. The rage was intense as the thing began pounding on the door. I saw a split near the top of the door starting. It wouldn't take long for it to get in now. I stepped back from the door, removed my gun from its shoulder holster. More pounding, and now I could hear the wood splinter. I heard the crack of the rifle from my balcony. I heard the bullet strike home. There was an unearthly scream, and the front of the door was completely split down the middle. Large, scarred hands with sharp fingernails forced the wood apart and roared at me. I shot. Again, it knew what I knew. I could see a portion of its face, and I fired. My bullet struck the creature under its one visible eye. And he grabbed the eye and ran off screaming. Another rifle shot and I flung the front door open. The creature was moving rapidly down the street and into the forest. I heard the sirens. The police would soon arrive. The county sheriff's office found Tracy's SUV 
in the roadside park. Three partially eaten bodies had been stored there, and there was no sign of any monster. A month passed, and during a rare snowstorm, my phone rang. I answered, and there was silence, and then I heard, They were tasty. I was sold a 25th hour. Routine is a poison. It will sneak into your veins and pull you through the calendar like a puppet. Your ideas of free could be melted away in the monotony of it all, and you'll think to yourself, if you just had extra time in the day that was separate from the responsibilities you have no choice but to indulge in. You'll tell yourself that over and over again, but it will already be too late. The poison, ha, huh, is settled, and you're confined to its illness. I, more than anyone else, was stuck in this pattern. My eyes would slide open every morning, and for a few minutes, I'd stare at the ceiling. A sea of smoke, stained yellows and faded greys. I would internally try to fight against the poison surging through my body, but every single time, I would lose that fight. Bare feet touching the cold hardwood, I began the day. The same day I had been living for the past 20 years. Work, lunch, work, bar, home, dinner, and sleep. I was at the complete whim of those perfect squares on the calendar, mindlessly making my way to the next one with no concrete end in sight. It was in this routine I was approached. I was offered a cure. But even cures come with their own list of side effects. At that point in my life, though I would take on a new sickness if it meant feeling something new. One day, not a special day or anything, just a day, during the bar portion of my routine where I sit and drink a glass or two, a gentleman sat down next to me. This particular bar was never very busy, and I was never much for conversation, so I just kept looking forward, despite feeling his presence beside me. Same shit, huh? His smooth voice caught me off guard, and almost out of instinct, I offered a quick side eye. He looked like any yuppie you might see, mixing in with the crowd on Wall Street. Phone dressed to the ear, even his words were smooth, like he had already tried to pitch something. The vulgarity, serving to relate with the common man, or something like that. The bartender was cleaning the other end of the bar, so I assumed he was talking to me, and in response I offered an acknowledging grunt. The kind that should give off the impression that I wasn't in the mood for conversations. And that's the thing about salesmen, or any good ones that are. They'll take your pension to avoid conversation and try to manipulate it. I used to hate that, day in, day out. The man next to me continued, his words like silk belonging to a Lexus commercial, trading stocks and bonds until my mind went numb. All I saw was numbers. If you give a salesman the room, they will take over a conversation in no time. The guy knew what he was doing, and it was working. His claims mirror my experience, staring at a computer all day, words becoming jumbled together until they were no longer coherent. <sighs> I hear you. I responded before filling my mouth with the amber liquid that was slowly disappearing in my cup. Then I found this. The man's words were coming out before my reply had barely escaped my lips. Here comes the pitch. I thought to myself, mentally sighing. Then I heard a soft clack of something hitting the bar. Another quick side eye, and I noticed a small plastic hourglass that had been placed in front of the man, and all its pure white sand resting at the bottom. Maybe you just need some extra time. You know, get a hobby or even just... Relax. My eyes became locked on the hourglass as his words spilled out. His pitch continued as I stared at the grains of untouched sand. An extra hour, he claimed. It was hard to take the notion seriously. I thought he would try and sell me some pill along with the hourglass. An actual substance, but no. The product was the hourglass itself. He offered it to me for just five dollars. That's all it took. Hell, the 
two beers I had just bought cost me more than that, and so I took it. It wasn't like he was giving me some sketchy products like vitamins or a workout DVD. It was just an hourglass. Turn it over for an extra hour. The instructions he gave before were completed. The transaction echoed in my head as I glared at the hourglass resting on my kitchen table. An extra hour from something as simple as an hourglass? All I needed to do was flip it, as the man had said. He told me once I flipped it over, the sand began to drain, I would have an hour all to myself, an hour that was outside the flow of time. The sand in the glass would continue to drain all on its own, and I could do whatever I wanted. A silly notion for sure, but all it took to prove that I had spent $5 on a 25 cent hourglass was a simple flip, so I figured, why the hell not? My arm reached out, picked up the small hourglass. It felt fragile, like if I gripped it any tighter than I already was, the sand would end up all over the table. For whatever reason, I felt my nerves stand on end as I turned the hourglass over and watched the first bit of sand trickle to the other hearth. Setting it down, I looked around my apartment and scoffed, noticing that nothing had changed. I sat back in my chair for a moment and let the breath I had been holding escape. Feeling foolish, I clicked my tongue and looked over at the window in the living room. It offered a view of the city and the birds would often perch on it. I thought my eyes were failing me when I looked at the bird flying by the window, only it wasn't flying. It was hanging in place and looked like a decoration in some hobby shops. Rising to my feet, I slowly made my way to the window and my view of the bird became clearer as it hung in a stasis. Its feathers that were ruffled by the wind were all frozen in various directions. I looked on in awe, just inches away from the unmoving bird, all too aware of the hourglass behind me. Beyond the bird was the city, a vast ocean of traffic and pedestrians. A bustling and alive city had become still. Cars sat in the roads as everyone had uniformly decided just to park their cars and leave them be. People were frozen in crosswalks with one foot off the ground and arms struck by the sides. I looked out on the land stuck within a snippet of time. Water drops hung mid-air and a gust of wind perpetually pushed trash. It had worked. I had found time outside of time. The first time I experienced my 25th hour, I just let it soak in. I just let myself live in that moment which is something I rarely took time to do. Just live. The second time, however, I left my apartment, walked around the city looking at anything and everything, observing how the frozen time had affected various things. I was so caught up in what I was looking at, I failed to pay attention to where I was going. My foot caught against the shin of someone frozen in time when I was sent down to the pavement. My knee landed first and in the fall I managed to rip my pants and received a small cut that pushed out a small bead of blood. The blood trickled out of the cut and once it was no longer attached to me, it too hung in the air outside of my 25th hour. Because of that, I learned another rule. Anything that happens to me within that hour doesn't actually happen. Once the sand had all fallen, I was teleported back into my apartment as if I had never left because according to the flow of time, I never did. And according to the flow of time, I never scratched my knee and so, my skin and pants were unscarred. Only the memories of the pain remained. I started entering the 25th hour every day. In it, I would read through books and start teaching myself various subjects. Day after day, I could dedicate that one hour that no one else had to better myself. It made living through the other 24 hours much easier. My attitude started turning around and my productivity went up at work. I started just feeling better. The poison was being drained. Then I realized, one day, I wasn't completely alone on the 25th hour. One day, I was strolling through a frozen city when I noticed something other than me was moving. It was a decent way in the distance but a thin blue line seemed to be moving 
when nothing else was. I thought it was a trick of the light, or my eyes failing me, but I continued to see the line every time I entered the 25th hour. Even more so, I couldn't shake the feeling that the line was getting bigger or getting closer to me. I would continue to do what I usually do in the 25th hour. I tried working out to improve my physical shape, but even the positive benefits would be erased. So, I continued to expand what my mind could do, while keeping an eye on that line. A month or so went by. It's a little hard for me to tell sometimes, as the extra time will throw me off here and there. About a month in though, the thin blue line had made its way into my city, no longer an obstruction within the skyline. It had gotten close enough for me to properly observe it, looking like nothing more than a blue ribbon waving in the wind. It wasn't the only one, more of these ribbons had appeared in the distance as the initial one closed in on me. The thing didn't look harmless. It just hung in the air, its body moving up and down like it was resting on a wavy sea. It became harder to enjoy my time in the 25th hour though. I didn't know what the ribbon was or what it was doing and it made me nervous. Especially as I noticed that it was getting closer to my apartment. The anxiety of watching these things got to me and it was around then that I begrudgingly decided not to enter the 25th hour anymore. I figured that I had improved my life, I had become a better person because of the break from the routine, and that I didn't need it anymore. Only that's what I continue to tell myself. Routines are like poison. They slip into your bloodstream. They feel normal. You make immunity to it and you just accept it. I hadn't realised it, but every day that I flipped that hourglass, I was making a new routine. My mind had seen the 25th hour lived in it, day after day. The 25th hour had become another injection of my everyday life. My brain wasn't just going to forget about it. On the day that I decided to stop entering the 25th hour, everything felt normal. I'd wake up, work, lunch, work, bar, home, bed. Resting my head down on the plush white pillows, I stared at the smoke-stained ceiling. I thought about how I never even smoked and waited for the rest to come to me, listening to the faint and peaceful noises of the world outside my apartment. Then, all at once, as my clock struck twelve, the world became silent, not a trace of audio from the nightlife-riddled city. Rising out of bed, I turned and looked out the window to look at the world frozen outside of it. My mind and perception of time had acclimated to entering the 25th hour. Whether or not I flipped the hourglass, my new poison was the extra hour. The city was hidden behind it, the floating blue ribbon resting just outside my bedroom just as birds would be in the mornings. I could see its structure bend and ruffle as it pressed against the pane of glass. I had never seen them make any progress towards me before, as they only moved from their spots when I wasn't looking. But there it was, trying to get into my room, and it made me feel ill. For the entire hour, I sat and watched it squirming around, trying to find some source of entry, as other ribbons swarmed closer. And then, the hour ended, and they were gone. The world outside continued as per usual. Nothing had changed except for my ability to sleep. I sat all night, looking at the window, wondering where the ribbons were wondering why they wanted to get into my house so badly. The next day, I was a zombie, so tired from not getting any sleep that I just shuffled through the day, skipping my visit to the bar. I hadn't even thought about trying to find the man that sold me the hourglass. There was no way someone like him was going to stick around once their prey had let him out of their sight. I wish I had gotten a better look at him. He was just so generic. Arriving home, I sat nervously and waited to see if I would once again enter the 25th against my will. I tried so hard to push the thoughts of the hour out of my mind, but when I heard the world around me stop, I knew it was no longer in my control. Just sitting there, hoping any sort of noise would indicate that I was still in the normal time flow, I felt pressure on my arm. 
and turning my head cautiously towards my arm, I saw the very distinct figure of the blue ribbon pressing against my bare arm. My heart started beating as I got the best look I could of the thing. The surface of the ribbon had a texture that reminded me of the snake's scales, only the scales were pointed at angles. I tried slowly as I could to start moving away from the thing, but as I did, I watched it form quickly and snap around my arm. Coiling along the length of my forearm, the thing wrapped tight and started to quiver. My arm erupted into fiery pain as the ribbon scowl started digging into my skin. Thin trails of red starkly painted against a bright blue. The pain was nearly enough to make me pass out, but I tried my best to fight against it. Putting my free hand on it in an attempt to pry it off only resulted in the skin of my palm being torn like it was nothing but a sheet of paper. The ribbon's once thin body started to thicken into more of a tube as my arm started to become weak and drained of blood. I tried to bash it against something, but I had lost so much blood so quickly that it quickly became difficult to move. I could only watch the thing eating away at me for an hour, moving up my arm when it could get all it could from one arm. When it moved off its previous feeding spot, the area it left behind was so battered and mangled that I barely recognized it as part of my body. This continued until the hour ended and suddenly I was staring at my arm which was in perfect health once more. Only the memories of the pain remained, but the memories were more than enough, more than I could handle. I looked everywhere the following day, grabbing the attention of every asshole wearing a blue suit that I could find. None of them were him. I knew it'd be long gone that I was running around the city like a maniac for nothing. Probably just looking for a distraction. Anything to take my mind off the next few hours. And there's nothing you can do to hold the advance of time. Even if you find a place outside of time, it will eventually move forward. As it does with me, every day. Every single day, I live the best I can knowing what's waiting for me at the end of the day. As I lay in bed, watching the clock closing in on the 25th hour. Once it arrives, I lay in bed and experience the same unbearable agony day after day. Dozens of those blue ribbons covering any opening that they can find, eating away at my body, gnawing at me with a white hot pain that sears through my flesh. I can feel every bit of it. The shock, it never settles in like you think it would. How could it? I tried running away before the 25th hour starts, but they're like dogs. They've tasted my blood and they always seem to find me. It's easier just to let it happen. I know the pain will end, but that never makes it any easier. It's been like this for over a year now, over a year of this insanity, and all I can think of is permanently taking myself out of the timeline. Even if the pain from their feeding vanishes when the hour ends, I still remember it. Remember every bit of the blood loss. Time is a poison. I live in a cycle of torment that I have no reprisal from. To those ribbons, I am just a perpetual source of food, something they can devour day after day. It's all like a poison. Don't tempt the sounds of time. Don't play with the threats of fate. Wow, wow. Absolutely superb writing there by all three authors. Thank you all so, so much for allowing me to narrate your wonderful work. Guys and girls, you know the drill. As ever, please do let us know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share. It really, really does help build the channel further. Help us smash our way through that 30,000 subscriber mark. And of course, don't forget the hashtag Team Fear. I hope you're all well and happy and had a wonderful and a profitable week. And above all, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>